Jackson. It's a film in design like films of the 70s that, that were willing to sort of discuss geopolitical issues without sort of pointing fingers directly at a specific person. Okay. You said they were both for you. What do you care? When we put the script out, the first thing that happened was everybody in town called and said, I want in. Because the star of this film is the screenplay that Gagan wrote, and everyone wants to be involved so far. That we, anybody we've touched has come around and said they want to do it. That's a nice feeling. When you say to an actor that's really talented and has carried a lot of movies themselves, and you say to them, listen, you know, the part you could do is this, and it's not a large part, and they, and they say, I don't care, I just want to be part of this. That doesn't happen very often, you know. I'd set up my own exchange. Hang on to my energy for as long as I could. I think a lot of people, you know, Matt's role, my role, there, we're all sort of, it's an ensemble piece. I've always had success in ensemble pieces. And just so that you said you did it, it's because you really want to be involved in the film. ER for me was a show like that where, uh, when you got ER, it was this great project. The role, you know, had five scenes in it. It wasn't like, well, I've got this, it's the George Clooney show. But the role itself was, it was small, but it was terrific. But I felt more like the show was the star. In much the same way this film is the star. The star of this film is the screenplay. So you're gonna be able to hear from here, this boom, 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 right. boom, boom, boom. And you may wanna acknowledge that right, okay. in some way. Steve Gagan's a really bright guy, really articulate, knows exactly what he wants. He won the Oscar for writing traffic, so he certainly understands disjointed, nonlinear storytelling. So I feel as if our job is to only find ways of supporting him and what he needs. Okay, so that makes it, it's making this noise. I'm eating it, kind of looking for Matt over there. You realize everyone's going there. I look back this way, nobody's there. The minute you go on location, it makes a big difference. You know, you know exactly what you're trying to do. For me, it's interesting to be in a third world. It's a very good way of informing us as actors. Million dollars. <laughs> All right, one million dollars. Boom, <laughs> seven. Oh, a nine. Uh, not good. There's certainly an element of danger that comes in going to Morocco. <laughs> 21. Oh, my God. The book can here. But all of those things were reasons we felt we had to do the film, not reasons to stay away from it. Initially, the character was written to be Bob Bear, the character that I'm playing. And it was an interesting thing because he's the last guy in the world you think would be working for the CIA. You know, sweet-faced, kind of nice gentleman. And, uh, and he was in the CIA for 20 years. Bob's book was really sort of fascinating. The more time that the writer and director Steve Gagan spent with Bob Bear, the more that they discovered there was a story actually to be told. He's got a great sense of adventure. You know, he gets himself in places where we would go, okay, that's deep enough into the cave. That's just where he starts. He's also incredibly bright, you know, knows a lot about a lot of subjects because he's had to. One of the factors, which is sort of my storyline, is the systematic deconstruction of the CIA over a period of time and wh what the effects of that were, which was there weren't very many Arab-speaking operatives in the Middle East, which is a danger. And you know what we've learned from the 911 Commission along the way was that we thought we were finished with the Cold War and that we didn't need CIA operatives on the ground. What is it you tell people you do these days, Bob? Between State Department and Defense. And so that was the first piece of the puzzle for the film was deciding how we were going to play this because we didn't want it to feel as if we were trying to make a political stand out of this film. The truth is we're actually trying to tell a story which is sort of apolitical. If I told you that I knew of something that was going to happen to someone, I felt that I had to stop it. What would you say? The more we started dealing with, the more we started talking about directions we wanted the character to go in, we realized that there were some issues with family 
and he has real family, you know, that are real breathing people and issues that we thought, well, we're not able to really explore these issues in fairness because these people actually exist. So why don't we give them a fictitious family and really be able to you know, give it some drama along the way and tell a story rather than just trying to, you know, insert sort of a documentary of one man's life into five other ongoing stories. So we felt like, let's get away from that. And we realized that we're just sort of taking the essence of the, the issues that Bob had to deal with and putting them on the screen. So I wasn't looking to mimic him because I knew I wasn't going to be doing Bob. What mostly I was doing was just trying to find out what were the procedures for him, what was recruiting like and all of those things. What you learn about it that I didn't understand as much is that two-thirds of your job is reading. You're constantly sort of just consuming information and you find that it's so healthy for him and it's contagious around the people that he's grown to love and his friends and stuff. He was a true believer, you know, he wasn't sort of this cynic. You know, Bob really believed in this is the right thing to do is this helps my country and I'm sure he did, you know, he doesn't really go into the things he did in the CIA and it's probably better that he doesn't, but you find that he was a true believer who became disillusioned because the company sort of let him down eventually, you know. He was part of the downsizing that happened to everybody else. And so he sort of experienced what the entire country was going through in a microcosm in the CIA. Action. So there was fun stuff to just spend time around. And what, what mostly we wanted to do was show a CIA operative at the end of his career without any prospects or any hopes or anything left. And just show a guy that's barely holding his act together, barely holding his family together, not moving up in the CIA and rapidly losing any clout he has there. Two men have been murdered. We've been tasked with the damage assessment. We'll need you to turn your passport over to us. Passports. And so for me, that the, the secret to that was to not look like I do in other projects. So it's, you know, put on 30 pounds in 30 days. And I was really comfortable. Shaved my hairline back. And, you know, it was a lot of fun. It's been interesting because you're completely anonymous. You know, I've tried other disguises before and they haven't worked, but if you put on 30 pounds and grow a beard and shave your hairline back, you can walk into any restaurant in town and not get a table. It's what we do in films, you know, I mean, it's, it's our job is to sort of transform ourselves. I had to learn to say some things in Arabic. And it was really an interesting thing because you know, if you're speaking Italian, which I don't speak, but I'm trying to learn, or if you speak, you know, any of the European languages, there's something you can latch on to. There's a word, there's a, there's a PH that you know is going to sound that way. And this, it's just a bunch of letters that you don't recognize. And it's sort of the same way with the language, you know, it's, you know, I say, Shukran ala heda leko malana malana dia tuka la musa we are de fidekel. And like, oh, I have no idea what, so you're literally learning it just phonetically first, but then it can't just be this disjointed thing you say. So that you have to find ways to reconnect. It was tricky, it went on for a bit. It was interesting, it was fun. We're in a time right now where, you know, we always feel like it's a good time to sort of stand up and be counted for and to talk about things that are important to you. You really can tell the difference when, when people are really invested emotionally in something and when, when they're not. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a job for everybody in the movie business. So, you know, some movies you go and people are obviously there just, just you know, paying the bills. And this obviously isn't one of those movies. You start thinking about the type of world you want to leave to your kid and and you know, what you can do, you know, can you make a difference? What's the point of entry if you want to make a change? The energy business has been incredibly important to the growth of the United States. You know, we invented the oil business. You know, we found oil and commercialized it in Pennsylvania in the 19th century. And over the whole growth, World War I, World War II, I mean, the strategic importance of oil to the United States 
is unassailable, and we have dominated this business. A lot of our Western archetypes have to do with the oil man, and it's just deep into the character of our country. My granddaddy was a wildcatter, same with my daddy. That's how I got my start. Luck and hard work. I recognize that I have to lower my footprint personally, you know, how much oil I consume, and yet I'm a guy from Kentucky. You know, I have a, I have a 66 GTO convertible with a 387 tri-power. You know, it's a 6.5 liter engine. I love driving it, you know, down Main Street in Venice with the top down. Um, is that patriotic or is that unpatriotic? Does it matter? I don't know. We're addicted to oil. We use more oil than anybody. We've allowed ourselves to get hooked and it's running out. And the question is how surprised will we be by that? How surprised should we be? Like what, what, what should we be doing as, as, a, as a culture to kind of prepare for that? Tell me, what are they thinking? This is a fight to the death. So what are they thinking? Great. They're thinking keep playing, keep buying yourself new toys, keep spending $50,000 a night on your hotel room, but don't invest in your infrastructure. Don't build a real economy so that when you finally wake up, they will have sucked you dry. We're the ones who are doing the pollution. We're the ones who are you know, buying the oil, putting it in our cars, driving our cars. I think if people from this film understand the, the scope of, of the, the picture and sort of identify that when you've got some of these you know, kind of dastardly people in the film who are avaricious and they're greedy. These for Dalton. I was on the other side of the Tengiz deal. The other side. God damn, is she a beautiful field. These are really cyclists for us. I mean, these are people who are our agents. They're acting for us to provide our demands. We can't, you know, in good conscience, as citizens, separate ourselves from them. We're all part of the same chain. We consume what they provide. By doing that, we sanction what they do to provide us with these things. The merged operations will create economies of scale to deliver the best quality products to the consumer at the lowest possible prices. It's cheap oil, we have to keep in mind, this is what this movie is about, is an addiction. And like any addiction, it affects our perceptions. The way we look at the world, we don't realize it, but we're very reluctant to take on these political forces or deal honestly with them. This is a big, dark, dangerous, sinister at times, very powerful world the oil industry and, and all that it implies, but it is very much a part of who we are as Americans. Imagine 30% of America unable to heat their houses, or gasoline $20 a gallon at the pump. And until there's some adjustments made in the ways in which we live as Americans, then the oil industry and industries like it are justified in finding and commercializing the resources that support that. You've just visited what someday soon could be the most profitable corporation in America. Well, provided the government approves the merger. Provided we don't start running automobiles on water. And provided there's still chaos in the Middle East. You want to be able to point at a time in history and say what you were doing during that period of time. And, um, and we wanted to be able to say that we were also involved in talking about you know, corruption at a time when corruption's a real issue. Corruption is our protection. Corruption keeps us safe and warm. Corruption is why you and I are prancing around in here instead of fighting over scraps of meat out in the street. Corruption is why we win. You know, you want to be able to say you stood on the right side of history. I think, you know, people certainly more recently have very strong feelings about corruption, given some of the kind of corporate malfeasance that have been brought to light over the last few years. I'd also like to thank our strategic friends from around the globe who are here tonight, most especially, Amir Meshal al Subai. Amir, thank you so much. The real issues to me were much more about the political structure and the, and the questions that we're raising. You know, we're not pointing fingers at one side of the aisle or not. We've got Stu Stevens, who's a big Republican, as a consultant on here, specifically to make sure that what we were really pointing at was a problem that needs to be fixed no matter who's in charge and has been coming up for years and years. Iran is a natural cultural ally of the U.S. Persians do not want to roll back the clock to the eighth century. And what I'd like to know is, if we keep embargoing them on energy, then someday soon, are we gonna have a nice, secular, pro-Western, pro-business government? If you, 
They let young people march in the street, and the next day they shut down 50 newspapers. The reform movement in Iran is one of the president's great hopes for the region and crucial to the petroleum security of the United States. These gentlemen are with the CLI, the Committee for the Liberation of Iran. There are no real bad guys in the movie. The, um, the people who are doing things that we may find morally questionable don't believe that they're doing things that are morally questionable and truly believe that what they're doing is for the good of the country. And they have a good argument. You dig a six-foot hole, you'll find three bodies. But you dig 12, and maybe you'll find 40. Christ, China's economy ain't growing as fast as it could because they can't get all the oil they need. I'm damn proud of that fact. It isn't clearly black and white. There are questions to be asked. It doesn't mean that there's anything right about terrorism, because there isn't. But it means we have to at least discuss what creates the environment for those sorts of things. And the only way you can do that is by starting with both elements being human beings. Why do they react that way? Is it a generational thing? Is it a, a social thing? What is it? Is it religion? You know, what are the issues? Religion becomes a big part of this film. People are so defensive of their religions, understandably perhaps, but nevertheless so defensive that they become intolerant. And that is an area that we're exploring in the film. You know, anyone who travels and you're in Morocco and you're in Casablanca and three to five times a day a siren goes off and everybody stops their cars and gets out in the middle of the streets and kneels down and bows and prays. Uh, anyone that thinks that you can bomb that ideal out of them, you know, needs to travel more. I think it's a really interesting thing when you take the two most likable characters in the film and you watch how they're sucked into an Islamic fundamentalist group and you begin to understand how something like that could happen. It's not an excuse for it at all, but it is saying you can't just categorize things. When you see Wasim working in an oil field or living in a trailer in foreign workers' barracks, and then you cut back to Robbie, Bob's son on the Princeton campus, and when you see Wasim laughing and joking with his friends and being not unlike American teenagers that we recognize, that um, it will create more empathy for, for them. The film is very much about who we are, and it's uh, not, I don't think some, it can't be characterized as some kind of knee-jerk liberal reaction to, you know, uh, American foreign policy uh, as driven by the oil industry. I think it's, it's more complicated than that, and it's more inclusive of all of our stories, uh, whether you be on the left or you on the right, but our stories as Americans and who we are and uh, what kind of footprints we leave. We, not they, the oil industry, but we leave out in the world. I think if people realize the, you know, the degree of venality and mendacity that exists in the business and the brutality of the strategic game that gets played out on the global stage, then I think we'll have done a service. Every company in the world wanted into Kazakhstan, into the Tangis, but Kaleen got it. And then Connex wanted Kaleen, and here we are. And I think if it moderates people's behavior and makes them think about what they consume, and uh, how it gets into their tanks, and you know, uh, I think it will then also have done a service. Syriana is one of the most relevant stories in the world today. And when you think about the role of oil and how it affects everything.
the miracle of this art form of film is that you take a world that seems so distant to the average American, so distant to my mom and dad in Kentucky, or distant to me, and I can show you another family in the Middle East just going about their day. In general, maybe everything looks different, but in the specific, you've got just people that want better lives for their children, and that's universal. And I hope people see that and take it away.